580. We'll sing the first and the fifth verse.
about to bring the lesson of praise, he'd have already remembered some of the things he prepared and delivered in such a way, Lord, that uh, it brings glory to thee and that we could uh, take that word and spread it in the community, Lord. And I pray for the church here at Skyline as we serve thee in this, in this area, Lord. I pray that we could go out, uh, seek those lost souls, Lord, and that we could uh, teach them the word and that they could uh, come to thee it's everlasting too late, Lord. Pray, Lord, be with the ones that's been on the sick and the prayer list. That we have many uh, this congregation that's sick, Lord. I pray that you'd be them, that they return their most wanted health, Lord. More importantly, Lord, I pray for those that are spiritually sick. Those that have not seen the need to be here uh, for whatever reasons, Lord, I just pray that something can be said or done, that they could see the error of their ways, Lord, that come back to thee before it's everlasting too late. Lord, just... Uh, Pray for those that are in the mission fields that are spreading thy word uh, around the world, Lord. I just pray that you would give them the wisdom and the strength that they need as they as they do this great work for thee, Lord. Lord, I also pray uh, that you would be with this country. Lord, uh, it is uh, special to be with those that are in the leadership positions, Lord, that they would look to thee for guidance, look to thy word as they make decisions each and every day, Lord. And I pray, as a, especially as elections will be coming up this year, Lord, I pray that as as we as Christians would look at those candidates and see what they stand for, Lord, and we would pick out those that seek Thy will and to seek Thy word, Lord, as, as close as they can, Lord. And just I pray that, uh, that once again this country could come back towards Thee, Lord. Just thank you for all that you do for us. Pray for those that's in the military that fight for our freedoms each and every day, Lord, that we can be able to come here this evening without any fear of persecution. But most importantly, Lord, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to set that perfect example that he did, Lord, and also die that cruel death on the cross to pay that ultimate sacrifice, Lord. Lord, I just uh, thank you for that that great sacrifice that was made, Lord. I just pray that you be with us. Please watch over us. Lord, just ask you please forgive us the sins of committee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You would remain standing like the Mark the Song of Invitation tonight. It's number 380. 380. Some poor Brother Troy comes number 150. 150.
Matthew chapter 25 as we continue our study that we began this morning, or last Sunday I should say. I said Matthew 25, Matthew 24. Uh, there will be more like it. Matthew chapter 24, as we're talking about the premillennial doctrine. And of course, uh, as we said this morning, this here, Matthew chapter 24, is where the premillennials list get a lot of their doctrine that they have. They misunderstand that there are two questions asked in this particular chapter, and Jesus answers the two questions. One question has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem, and the second question has to do with signs for the coming of the end of time. And of course, uh, in one particular question, signs are given. And of course, the answer in the other question is, no signs are given. And so if you are one who interprets Matthew chapter 24 as having to do with the, the whole chapter having to do with the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, then of course you misunderstand what Jesus is saying and you misapply a lot that he has said. Now, this morning we begin by going back to Matthew chapter 21. And we went forward to Matthew, the end of Matthew chapter 25. So that we could get the context that is taking place at this particular time in Matthew chapter 24. We know that prior to Matthew chapter 24, we have Jesus who has been ridiculed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and we know that they have tried to trick him to doing and saying things that they could get him on but we understand that Jesus has cleansed the temple in chapter 21. We understand by parables that Jesus taught that he blamed the Pharisees for the problems that were happening at the time and then after chapter 24 we have three parables that deal with the second coming of Christ. The first one has to do with the ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish, which teaches us that we must always be ready and prepared to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom could come at any time, and therefore we have to be prepared. We looked at the second parable that had to do with the parable of the talents. And that is the fact that we must take hold of every opportunity that comes our way as far as the gospel is concerned because we don't know how long we will be here upon this earth. As in the parable, they didn't know when the, when the uh, master who went into a far country would return. But when he did return, he did take account of those that whom he had left talents with there. And then finally, a third a uh, parable that we had in Matthew chapter 25 had to do with the goats and the sheep and how that the goats were those on the left hand, the sheep were those on the right hand. It was the goats that were condemned. It was the sheep that were uh, blessed. And we read in verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If you go back to Matthew chapter 23, a scathed and rebuked by Jesus amongst the Pharisees and the Sadducees, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. There, a number of times, five or six, seven times, Jesus uses that phrase in describing the people, that is, the scribes, the Pharisees, and he calls them hypocrites because a hypocrite is claiming to do something or to be something that one is not. And that's exactly what he was saying pertaining to the Pharisees, the scribes as well. But in verse 36 of this passage in Matthew 23, we have this saying, Jesus speaking, Verily I say unto you, All these things shall come upon this generation. Now what are those things that are going to come upon this generation? Well, you go down to chapter 24, and he begins in verse 2. Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. 
the city of Jerusalem, the temple of God. They were looking at Herod's temple at this particular time. And Jesus said, There shall not be one stone of this temple left upon another. It shall be utterly destroyed. And when would that take place? History tells us that happened in A.D. 70, per se. Verse 3 says, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What things? Go back to verse 36. All these things shall come upon this generation. Skip over to verse 34 of chapter 24. Verily I say unto you, <coughs> this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So the phrase all these things as used here in Matthew 23, 24 <coughs> refers back to those things that Jesus is fixing to talk about in verse 1 through verse 34. <coughs> because in verse 34 he says, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. A generation is 40 years. And so within a 40 year period, these things were going to occur that he's going to talk about here <coughs> beginning in verse 4. And so it's important that we understand the distinction. We, under, we need to see that there are two questions being answered here. For instance, look at verse 36 of this chapter. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Now wait a minute. If Jesus is not talking about two different things here, why in the world would he say, but of that day no man knoweth, when he just got through telling about signs, verses 4 through 35. And there are signs that we can see. See, that pertains to the destruction of Jerusalem. The things that which we know not have to do with the second coming of Christ. And friends, that's consistent throughout the New Testament. It is consistent with the Bible, that is, the teaching of the Bible. Two questions are asked. So let's look at the destruction of Jerusalem. What are going to be some of the signs for the destruction of Jerusalem? Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, one of the things we're going to see here that there were a lot of antichrist, a false Christ, people who claimed to be the Christ, the Messiah, and so on. And this was happening many years before A.D. 70. There. Look at verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many false Christ would come and say they were Jesus, the Messiah, and yet they would not be. Josephus, who is a historian, Justin, who uh, and Jerome, and Irenaeus, and Origen, these were all church history fathers. All these men said that there were those that came claiming to be the Christ, and they came to deceive. Notice he said, take heed that no one deceive you there. Verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Back in the 60s, about the middle 60s, we had the Cuban crisis here, which is just a few miles off of the southern tip of Florida there. And we had people that were so literally scared that we were going to be in a nuclear war, an atomic war, that they began to build underground shelters to protect themselves from the blast that would happen during this process. And of course we understand that wars and rumors of wars have been around for years. I would dare say that there have been very few times in the history of the world where somewhere in the world there has not been a conflict of some kind going on. Now, especially when we get to the Middle East, over there in Iran and Iraq and Israel and Palestine and the uh, Syria and places like that today, when they begin to, to fight amongst themselves, then people begin to worry because they think that this is a sign of the coming of the end of time. Pat Robertson who used to be a part of the 700 Club, was one of those men who every time something happened over there in the Middle East, he would jump up and down and say, here are the signs of the coming of the end of time. Friends, this has been going on for hundreds of years. This is nothing new. 
These men have been saying it. I, they have been saying this since I was a young man. They've been saying the world is coming to an end, and it hasn't come yet. Now, it may come soon. It may come within the next few years, the next few hours or whatever, but we're not going to know that. There is no way that we're going to be able to predict that. But what Jesus is saying, you can know. There are signs that will tell you about the destruction of Jerusalem. At the time of Jesus made this prophecy, there was peace throughout the Roman world. At the time that Jesus is speaking here, the Roman world, there was peace. But within five years of the destruction of Jerusalem, in just one year alone, four emperors of Rome set up on the throne. In other words, in one year, you had a different emperor four times that year. Thousands of Jews were slaughtered in Alexandria, Damascus, and Caesarea. The Jewish revolt against Rome began in 67 A.D. and did not end until 73 A.D. And so here are wars and rumors of wars... Wars were going on then. Wars have been going on for all of time, per se. But Jesus said unto them, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars, and they were getting closer to home, these wars were. And so Jesus said, here is a sign. In verse 7, For the nation shall rise against nation, and the kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence, earthquakes in divers places. Times are going to be going along as usual. You know, we have earthquakes, we have tornadoes, we have uh, uh, these different and various things, famines and pestilence. That has happened and occurred throughout the ages. But we also notice in Acts chapter 11, 28 and 29, that during Claudius Caesar's reign, there was a great famine over the country there in Israel and in the time of the uh, Middle East there. There was a plague in Rome about the same time. The reign of Nero, which was somewhere around 64 A.D., that killed 30,000 people. Josephus and Tychicus both tell of plagues that ravaged Babylon in A.D. 40, and then again Italy in 66 A.D., an unusual number of earthquakes occurred at this particular time as well. An earthquake occurred there in Rome the day that Nero became emperor in 54 AD. Laodicea, which is one of the seven churches of Asia, was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 60. Pompeii was hit by an earthquake in AD 63. Rome was shaken by an earthquake in, uh, in uh, A.D. 68. There were also earthquakes in Crete, Smyrna, Miletus, Salmas, Helopolis, uh, Colossae as well. Josephus interpreted the number and frequency of these earthquakes as a sign of the coming destruction upon man in his book Wars, book 4, chapter 4, verse 5 there. So here are an un, unusual number of earthquakes, famines, pestilence that are going to happen. And this is prophesied. This is told about by Jesus. Now when we get to verse 9, he says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now one of the things that happened is the fact that when Nero took over as Roman emperor, he began to persecute the Christians. As a matter of fact, Nero burned the city of Rome and blamed it on the Christians so that they would be persecuted not only by his people but by the people in the city itself. He blamed it and he's the one that started it, per se. And so we see that here you're going to be persecuted as such. Now, Jesus warned of persecutions, did he not? In Matthew chapter 10, look at verse 16 beginning. Behold, I send you forth in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpent, harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they shall deliver you up to councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. 
For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father the child. The children shall also rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. You see, Jesus warned that this was going to happen. And it did happen. When persecution came about, many of those would sell out their kinfolks, their mothers, their fathers, their parents, their grandfathers, their aunts, their uncles. They would sell them out so that they would not be persecuted themselves there. The Bible warns of it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 12, Paul even warns the young evangelist Timothy that those that are righteous, those who are going to live the Christian life, are going to suffer persecution. He even warned Timothy about that. Paul even warned the brethren in Acts chapter 14 and verse 22 that there was going to be afflictions brought upon the brethren there. We know that in Acts chapter 7 uh, there and in Acts chapter 8 that there was persecution amongst the church. I mean, Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7. Paul made havoc of the church, Acts chapter 8. And so we see the persecution at that time. Both Peter and Paul were probably put to death about this time when Nero became, began to rule in Rome. The first, first book of, the book of 1 Peter, I should say, was written to encourage Christians during a time of persecution against Christians there. And so now we see what Jesus has just said here. Verse 10. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Why? To save their own skin. That's exactly why they betrayed one another per se. Verse 11 tells us, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Sheeps in wool, wool's clothing we might say. Jesus warned about Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. Again, Paul warned the elders of Ephesus at the uh, city of Miletus when he gave his talk that there would be savage wolves that would come in among the disciples. He even talked about the falling away of the eldership. It would happen among the eldership, the falling away there. And so we see the warnings given and here Jesus talks about the many false prophets that shall rise and shall deceive many. Many people even today are deceived by false prophets, by false teachers. And so it was nothing new at the time on which Jesus was speaking. Verse 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. You know, the Bible tells us and admonishes us, even in the book of Revelation, He admonished those brethren, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee the crown of life. The crown of life was only promised to those who would endure, those who sustained and endured for a period of time until the Lord came again. Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, not the end of time, Keep in mind in verse 34, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What things? All these things we're reading about right now from verse 4 all the way up to verse 34. And so we see that the gospel is going to be preached. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. And so now here is a sign. There, the gospel has been preached to every creature from under the heaven. The faith of the church at Rome, spoken of throughout the whole world, Romans chapter 1 and verse 8. And so we see the gospel was preached to the whole world, just as Jesus said it would be. And then shall come the end, but not the end of time, the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at verse 15. When ye... Uh, therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And let all them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Here is this idea of the, desola uh, the abomination of desolation here. Here would be a sign, a signal that the destruction of Jerusalem was imminent. It was imminent. You know this morning I told you that uh, because of this very warning that Jesus gives here, that uh, not one Christian 
died in the, destru in the uh, destruction of the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Not one. All of them were out. Why? They saw the signs. They could see the handwriting on the wall. Jesus had warned them. Jesus had told them about it. Look, if you would, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 20 is a parallel passage. And it says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. The abomination of desolation. <clears throat> when the armies of Rome surround the city, then you know. Now, as I told you this morning, for whatever reason, <clears throat> the Roman army came to the city of Jerusalem and then withdrew itself back to Caesarea for a period of time, which time gave time for the Christians to get out of the city of Jerusalem. Do you think that just happened per chance? Not at all. The Lord had warned. There was a reason why that happened, and God saved those who took heed to the warnings that he spoke there. Now, as we get here, verse 16, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains there. In other words, get out of the city. Look at verse 17. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. You don't have time to take anything out. You've got to get out of there and go. Take what you have and leave the city. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes or cloak, the American standard says. But woe unto them that are with child, to them that give suck in those days. It's hard to run from the enemy with a child in your arms. Basically, that's what Jesus is saying. Hopefully, you won't be pregnant. Hopefully, you won't have a child in which time you have to flee to have to deal with, he says. And verse 20, But pray ye that your flight be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now, the reason the flight needs to be not on the Sabbath day was because the gates were closed. The city closed the gates on the Sabbath day. It would be hard to escape the city with the gates closed on the Sabbath day there. For then shall be great tribulation, such as what not, was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The fact of the matter is here is clear warning. There's going to be great tribulation now as a result of this uh, Roman army coming in. The destruction of Jerusalem, as he said a while ago, was foretold by Daniel the prophet in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. The seven weeks would be the time from the decree of Cyrus to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem until the completion of the walls by Nehemiah. Now you go back to Daniel chapter uh, 9, you'll see that. Then there are 62 weeks that he makes mention of would be the period of time from the rebuilding of the walls to the coming of Christ. And then there is one week that is mentioned which would be from the time coming of Christ unto the destruction of Jerusalem and that would be one week according to Daniel's prophecy. And it was done just exactly as Daniel prophesied there. Now, Jesus has warned them that when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the armies of Rome surrounding the city, it's time to leave. Get up and leave. Don't go back to, if you're on the rooftop, just leave. Don't go down and try to collect any clothes or anything like that. Get out of the city. And so we see the warnings that Jesus has given here as such. Look at verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect saved, uh, excuse me, the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. There. The elect's sake are those who are Christians. It's going to be hard. But you're going to survive if you heed my warning. If you get out of the city, you will survive. Verse 23. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Jesus said, Don't believe it. If somebody tells you that, that, that he or she is Jesus or Christ. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Noted, the wonders and signs are going to be so good that if it were possible... They shall deceive the very elect, those who were God's followers there. That's who could be deceived. And so you need to be very careful. Don't follow 
just any Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes along and tells you a story that they're Jesus the Christ, don't you go following and running after him because it's not going to be so. Jesus is saying, I am the Son of God. I am here right now. I won't be here down the road when this all transpires and takes place. Behold, verse 25, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. Don't believe everything you hear, those who come and claim to be the Son of God. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, shows out, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Rest assured, abomination and desolation is coming to the city of Jerusalem. Just as the lightning lights in the east and shines in the west. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. The carcass is reminiscent of the death, the carnage that's going to take place in the destruction of Jerusalem there. And so this is going to transpire and happen. It's going to be a sad time for the city of Jerusalem. It's going to be a sad time for those who are Christians who have to try to escape to get out of the city of Jerusalem. Verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now we begin to get into apocalyptic language. This was language that could be understood, that would be understood by the Jews, but not necessarily understood by someone who might get a hold of what was said. In other words, the book of Revelation, a lot of it is written in apocalyptic language. It would be hard for the government to understand what was being said, although the Jews would know exactly what was being said because of the apocalyptic language. What he's saying in verse 29, governments are going to begin to fall in Rome. Not in Rome, sorry, in Jerusalem. And so the governments that are in power at the time of the city of Jerusalem in AD 70, they're going to lose their power. There were a lot of insurrections within the city of Jerusalem within the few years of the destruction of Jerusalem. People who rose up trying to fight against the Roman government and so forth. Verse 30 says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is not Jesus coming in the clouds. This is the judgment of God that is coming <coughs> upon Jerusalem. And it's figurative in the fact that he is, uh, it's figurative the fact of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The judgment and is coming upon Jerusalem and it's getting pronounced by the God of heaven, per se. God is bringing justice to the city of Jerusalem. He shall send his angels, verse 31, with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, look at verse 32. Here, here's a parable, he says. He says in verse 32, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branches is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know the summer is nigh. Just as sure as you know the summer is nigh, so likewise, verse 33, ye, when you see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. It's imminent. It's going to happen. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So we see the picture. Jesus has given the signs. He tells them what to look for. He tells them how to react when the signs come. Get you out of the city. Don't go back into the house to try to collect things. Get out of the city and hope and pray it's not on a Sunday. And hope and pray you're not with child or have child but when it comes time to escape. Now when we get to verse 35, he says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Surely it shall come to pass, just as I said it is. It's going to. But in verse 36, we see that word, but. It's a transitional word. But of that day. Now we answer the second question that was asked in chapter 24. Of that day and hour knoweth no man. Now, 
the things we've read before are signs so that they can know when the destruction of Jerusalem is coming. But when Jesus comes the second time, they're not going to know. Nobody's going to know. Jesus himself, when he was upon earth, did not know at that time. Jesus knows now. But Jesus didn't know why he was upon earth when that hour would be. Because he says, Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Even angels in heaven did not know when the end of time would come. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now we're talking about the second coming. How is it going to be? It's going to be as it was in the days of Noah when the flood came. What were they doing? They were eating. They were drinking. They were being merry. And then the floods came. The waters began to descend. And the waters began to rise. And then the flood was upon the earth. For as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them away, all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So when Jesus comes, it's not going to be uh, a time when we're looking for him. It's not going to be a time where we know he's coming because of the signs that we've seen. Now, it is true that when Jesus does come, that we're going to know it's Jesus. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with about verse 16, the trump is going to sound and the archangel is going to blow that trump and everyone is going to see our Lord. He's going to know who Jesus is. Not going to be a question as to whether or not, who is this fellow here? You're going to know who the Lord is as such. He says here in verse 39 and continuing, uh, excuse me, verse 40, Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. What is that, preacher? Well, here are two people in the field. They're working. And when the Lord comes a second time, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the righteous shall come forth <coughs> there from the grave. And then those that are living at the time shall meet the Father in the sky, in the clouds. There. So, here's two in the field. One's a Christian, one's not. The Christian is going to rise forth. He's going to leave the field. The other is going to be left. Look at verse 41. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken. The other left. Same situation. One's a Christian. One's not. Watch therefore. For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. How, much, how many times does Jesus have to say. We do not have signs pertaining to the second coming of Christ. And yet your premillennialists turn right around and say, look, didn't you see all these signs here in Matthew chapter 24? Well, yeah, there are signs in Matthew chapter 24, but not for the second coming. Jesus even tells us so. No man knows, for ye know not the hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known and watched the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broke up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. When you least expect him, expect him. If I knew when the thief was coming to my house, I'd be prepared. You would be prepared. We'd have a sheriff waiting there, or we'd have a gun sitting there waiting on him when he walked through the door. We would be prepared. But we don't know when the thief comes, just like we don't know when the Lord is going to come. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his Lord had made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. There. Notice, what is this one servant doing? He says, I find so doing. Not just thinking, but doing. You know, a lot of people think about the coming of the end of time. What are we doing in preparing ourselves for the end of time? Verse 48, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants to eat, drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and he shall cut him asunder, and appoint him to his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here is a parable talking about that. 
servant who followed God for a while, it would seem. And yet on the other hand, here's another servant. The Lord delayed in his coming. He got tired of waiting, so he, he decided the Lord wasn't coming, so he began to beat his servants. He began to kill his servants. And then the Lord shows up at a time least expected. And he dishes out judgment. And he dishes out punishment. And that's the way it's going to be, brethren. In chapter 25 now, as you end chapter 24, we have those three parables we talked about this morning. The parable of the, of, the, of the ten virgins, one five wise, five foolish. We have the parable of the talents, which teaches us we have to take care of every opportunity that comes our way while we're living here upon the earth because we know not when the Lord is going to come. And we need to get things done for God. And they also have the judgment seen. To me, it's simple. The Bible is not difficult and hard to understand. What makes it difficult and hard to understand is when men try to take what is written plain and try to twist it to make it fit a doctrine they want to believe. The doctrine of premillennialism is as false to the core as can be because of the fact Matthew chapter 24 is not, and I repeat, is not the sugar stick that they think it is. Matthew chapter 24 teaches just the opposite of what premillennialism would have us to believe, and yet they still hold to it. If you're here tonight, not a member of the Lord's church, the kingdom of God, notice premillennialists would have us to believe that the church is a temporary state. That when Jesus came, he did not set up his kingdom, but that is not true either. We've already shown in our study thus far. The kingdom and the church are the same. Peter was asked, do you believe that I am the son of God? And Peter said, I believe that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, verse 19, after he had promised in verse 18 that he would build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. The kingdom. The kingdom. The church and the kingdom are the same. And so we know that from Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. The kingdom has come. And so we implore with you, if you're not a member of the Lord's kingdom, the Lord's church, the Lord's body, become a member. Hear the word, believe it, repent of your sins, confess the good name of Christ for the remission of sins, and the Lord will, and be baptized for the remission of sins, and the Lord will add you to his church. If you are here, a member of the Lord's church, and yet have gone astray and need to make things right, we encourage you to do that as well as together we stand in as we sing.